by God on our behalf, something we could not do ourselves, which was to bring salvation. And as we come to that reality, that truth, we're going to veer away from the book of Jude. This morning, we're going to look at Psalm 136, and we're going to discover what it was that the kids were learning all week long in our vacation Bible school about praising God. Why do we praise God, and how do we praise God? If you have your Bibles, open them up somewhere in the middle to the book of Psalms. We're going to be near the end of the book of Psalms, Psalm 136. Now, the book of Psalms was written over a season of time. It wasn't all written in one day, but roughly 1,000 years before Jesus was born as a human being and walked among us. So roughly 3,000 years ago, this collection of Psalms was put into a book, and it became the very thing that helped thousands of people, millions upon millions of people throughout the years. And it's going to help us today, learning why we praise God and how we praise God in the details of life. Uh, most of the Psalms were written by different authors. Uh, some were written by Moses, some were written by Asaph, some were written by unknown individuals. But one person you might be very familiar with, that is King David. And David wrote most of the Psalms, and he wrote this particular Psalm, and he wrote it in response to things that were happening in his life. He had the ups and he had the downs. Sometimes he was on the mountaintop and he was able to praise God easily. Other times he was down in the valley and it was very, very difficult to say, praise God, hallelujah. That's the Hebrew for the praise, praise the Lord. I think every one of us here has been on mountaintops and in valleys, probably even this week. As Mike and Jackie go back to their house, it's a little bit of a valley. I pray that they come onto the mountaintop. But that is what life is all about down here. It's not going to be like that when we get to the top of the mountain, when we get to heaven. And we are learning how to praise the Lord together. And so Psalm 136 was one of the responses in a period of David's life where things were not good. You would think it was very good, but it was not good. And he chose to write it down what God was doing in his life and in those around him. So we start off, it says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Now, what did we just do? We all stood up and we said, just like Mike told us, we repeated that last phrase. Repeat it after me. His love does forever. 26 times through the book of, uh, sorry, through the Psalm 136, we are told that God's love endures forever. Uh, Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says, and this is God speaking, behold, and that phrase behold is a good old English phrase, it means gaze intently upon this truth, peer into the wonders of this treasure, or uh, think on this deeply, chew on it, behold, it says I have loved you with an everlasting love. And with, the, the, and with the bands of kindness, I have drawn you. I have poured you to myself. God is saying, I've loved you with an everlasting love. It's a love that will never quit. A love that will never fail. A love that will never fade. It's a love that is not affected by what you do. It's because of what I've done. This is God's love. And David is saying, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. He's good. There are many people that do not know that God is good. There are Christians that do not know that God is good because they're measuring what God is like by what their life is like at that moment. And David is telling us it's not about what's going on in your life right now. God is good, and there is a good end to what he is allowing in your life. His love endures forever. He goes on to say this, give thanks to the God of God's. This is not just another God amongst many gods. This is the God of gods. This is the living God. This is the one who is the king of the universe. He goes on to say, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. I, I have some friends who are Muslim. They cannot say that Allah's love endures forever. In fact, they don't even know if Allah loves. He's capricious. I have a friend who is Buddhist uh, back in England. He doesn't have an understanding that God is personal. You can't have a conversation with God. You can't pray to him and expect uh, God to trust, uh, to uh, obey the word that he wrote down and then follow through on it. 
because there's no understanding of a personal God. You can't say that his love endures forever. There are people who are atheists, like I was before I became a Christian, and I couldn't say that the God of this world, in my understanding, which would be career chasing, my boss, he'll give me more money if I work harder for him, his love won't endure forever. He might fire me. In fact, the more you look at every other single thing that we could call a God or an idol or something that would replace the Lord Jesus Christ, the love does not endure forever. Only Jesus Christ has a love that endures forever. And David is telling us we have to praise God. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. And then he kind of shifts. He's going to now tell us why. Why do we give thanks to God? How do we know his love endures forever? Well, he's proven it. This is not a God that just says, do what I tell you to do. This is a God that says, please do what I tell you to do, and I'll show you why. I'm going to prove myself. And I think most of us here know a God that has proven himself over and over and over. And this is what David says. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Now, let me stop right there. This is the God that does great wonders. He does great wonders. Now, there's a parallel chapter in the Bible, in the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, very specific, particular, um, gives exactly the same psalm being read out by the priests. And it's exactly what Mike has told us. Many times when the, everyone got together to worship God, the priest would stand up and he would read a portion of scripture, and then the people who were worshiping God would repeat one line. Didn't happen all the time, but it happened on occasion, which is where the, we sometimes have churches that take liturgy. Liturgy is not something that we see all throughout the Bible. It's not something we see in the New Testament church, but it is something we do see from time to time. And so this morning, as we are going through this some a bit more, just as we did earlier, and you don't have to stand for this, as you're seating, we're going to just shout out very uh, momentarily each part, his love endures forever. There's a reason for this. David wants us to remember something. It's very hard to remember that God's love endures forever when you are in the middle of something so terrible in your life and you can't see the way forward. Very difficult. And God is saying, I want you to remember. And so he says, to him alone who does great wonders, his love, love, love endures forever. <laughs> he wants to do great wonders in your life. Love when you Keep going. <laughs> Who by his understanding made the heavens? His love endures forever. Amen. And then he says this, verse 6 Who spread out the earth upon the waters? His love endures forever. Who made the great lights? His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day? His love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. This is an amazing portion between verses 4 up to, per, up to verse 9. Because David is telling us this is why we praise God. First of all, because he created everything. You know, in the book of John, chapter 1, it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 of that same chapter, John tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, full of glory and grace. That's Jesus Christ. God became a man in the incarnation. He became just like you, just like me. And he lived this perfect life so that he could go to a cross that we deserved to pay for our sins, even though he was innocent, and do the very thing we couldn't do. Bill, why would he do that? Because his love endures forever. And David is telling us, he alone does great wonders. That is the greatest miracle ever performed, the cross. By his understanding, he made the heavens. John also tells us that in verse 3 of John chapter 1, that by the word, everything was created. That Jesus is the one that created everything. Colossians 1.18, he's the one who created everything and he deserves the preeminence. So that's why David says he's the Lord of Lords. He's the God of gods. In your life and mine, Jesus is king. He's the Lord. He spread out the earth upon the waters. Now, that's a fascinating thing for David to say because that is space. 
Do you know that God created space? Jesus created space. He goes on then to say that uh, verse uh, 7, he made the great lights. Why? Because his love endures forever. He created time. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the very first opening verse of the entire Bible, all 66 books. God says, in the beginning, just like John says in John chapter 1, in the beginning, God made the heavens, space, and the earth. And he separated the darkness from the light. He brought in light, which is time. So you've got space and time all in that first opening. Why would you not want to read the rest of the Bible? <laughs> it's an amazing book. This is the living God who's written it to us because his love endures forever. And if you are a sci-fi geek here, I think Tim is here. I'll have to pick on Tim some a little bit. If you're a sci-fi geek, you don't have to worry that space-time continuum is going to suddenly rip apart and unroll like you see in some of those Star Trek movies. <laughs> because God is faithful. He created it and his love endures forever. When I first was reading the Bible as an atheist and, and starting to get to grips with some things. And after I became a Christian and God started to speak to me through his spirit and I actually started to understand some of the things in this book, it was amazing to me to think that God made everything and that God had finely tuned everything. I was into uh, cosmology at that time, looking up at uh, the heavens and, and I, it was in a science class where I wanted to learn more about this world that we lived in and the heavens and the universe. And I believed it all came from a big bang and it astonished me that everything was so finely tuned. I call that the argument for the existence of God. Uh, it's the cosmological argument. I also discovered that everything maybe could have come from a Big Bang, but nobody really knows. But even if it did, that proves that there was a first cause. Wait a second. That's what the Bible says. And I read that. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. He made everything. He is the first cause. That's the causological argument for God's existence. See, the Bible never tells us that God exists. It just assumes that God exists. But what it does tell us is that we are to praise God because his love endures forever. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Shortly after I became a Christian, I got talking to a friend of mine, a good friend who was a Muslim, Imran. And we talked about the causological argument, the cosmological argument, which he agreed with as a Muslim, but he didn't believe in Jesus being God. He believed in Allah. And, and then we started talking a little bit more about morality. And he understood that there was right and wrong. And I said, how can you get that from Allah though? If Allah doesn't even, you don't even know if you love him. He's capricious. In fact, he even lies. And my friend agreed, that's what he's allowed to do in the Quran. But in the Bible, we're told that God does not lie. He's not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should boast. He tells the truth. In fact, he even says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And so when we look at the reality of morality in every single human heart, we all know that there is a right and a wrong, which means there must be a lawgiver that makes laws that tell us there is right and wrong. That's the moral, that's the moral argument for the existence of God. And my friend obviously had to agree. He didn't like it, but he agreed. And David is telling us, look, his love endures forever. There is no way around this. That's why the Apostle Paul will tell us in Romans 1 that no man, no woman, no boy, no girl is without excuse. You can look to a God who's trustworthy. He's finely tuned this world. He made the great lights. He's, he made the sun to govern the day, verse 8, because his love endures forever. He made the moon and stars to govern the night because his love endures forever. Did you know this universe is so finely tuned, even secular scientists agree that there had to have been some kind of a creator. Maybe it was an intelligence just born out of nothing. They don't really want to explain that it could be a personal creator uh, like Jesus. So there's the intelligent design argument. If the sun was just two degrees to the left, two degrees, it's like a tiny little fraction in space, two degrees to the left, our earth would burn up. We would all be toast. I wouldn't just be getting sunburned as a British guy in the summer, but we would all be getting sunburned. <laughs> but it's not. It's finely tuned. Scientists can't understand just how everything is so finely tuned out of nothing. Random molecules coming together from a big bang over long periods of time in evolution and all of this. And then you think about human beings. 
They shake their heads and they continue to follow a lie because they don't want to listen to the God whose love endures forever. But his love endures forever. 212 degrees, my, my water in my tea kettle boils and I make my coffee. Why? Because God designed it that way so that I would have a role in my life that shows me that I can trust that I can always make coffee when I plug in my tea kettle. Amen. God did that. It wasn't men. It was God that put in those laws and rules. He cares about every single detail of our life because his love endures forever. 32 degrees, our water freezes, and becomes ice. And then we have a bunch of you guys going out ice fishing. You crazy dudes. <laughs> God cares. And so he wires everything so that we have boundaries and rules and we understand what's ahead. But it's all pointing to him so we can understand that his love endures forever. Now, this is amazing. David then shifts again. He says, not only is this the reason why, but let me tell you how God proves his love for you. And he's talking to a group of people that knew the history but had forgotten the history of their people. How God was active in their lives in a personal way. Same with us. We need to remember how God is active in our lives. Verse 10. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love, his love endures forever. They were in captivity and as slaves in Egypt for 400 years. No way out. And yet God sent Moses, and most of us know the story, God set them free from slavery, brought them out. And he did it through a number of plagues, the last plague being the worst one, to show the Pharaoh who was in charge that God was greater. He struck down the firstborn of Egypt because his love endures forever. He will not let anyone stay enslaved in sin. If you're struggling with sin, just talk to the one that can set you free. He will, because his love endures forever. It goes on in verse 11. He brought out Israel out from among them. His, his love, love endures. endures forever. Are you getting this? Are you, are you starting to think, wow, this is the love of God. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, I think we just sang that, didn't we? His love, love endures forever. His arm is not too short that it cannot save, we're told by Isaiah. His arm is not too short that he cannot help call you out of the way of danger or pick you up when you do something ridiculously sinful or silly and fall to the ground. He can hold you and he can keep you. It's not too short. Verse 13, to him who divided the river asunder, the river, uh, the, the Red River, I should say, the Red, Red Sea, his love endures forever. And it goes on and talks about how God rescued God's people. Think about your own lives. Think about the times in the past where God has delivered you from things. He has rescued from you from situations where perhaps you had moments of depression. You just could not get out. God wants to deliver you from those things, and he does. And all the time, if you're still in depression, as you come to this book and you look and you talk to God and God reminds you of his goodness, he proves his love for you. It does not fade. It does not tarnish. It does not grow old. It does not quit. Regardless of where you are, what sins you've committed, how much you have failed, what your mistakes are, he's right there because of what he did on the cross. His love endures forever. Let's go on all the way down. The verse 23 says he remembered us in our low estate. His love, love endures, endures forever. Think about yourself when you were at your lowest point. There have been many points in my life where I've been very, very low. And yet God was right there and he remembered me in my low estate. He didn't just push me aside. Some Christian you are. No, he looked at me and said, I remember you. I love you. And my love endures forever. This is, this is an incredible reality. It says in Psalm 107 that my flesh fails. Your flesh fails. Sometimes you aren't able to do the things you want to do. You get tired, you get weary, or in your mind you start thinking wrong thoughts, doing wrong things. Our flesh fails. It says in Psalm 38, verse 10, that my heart and my flesh, my mind, fails. We're not always perfect. We're not always good. We're not always, not always right. Sometimes we're very wrong. It goes on to say, um, 
2 Timothy 2.13. Even when we are faithless, God is faithful. God is faithful. Why is he faithful? Why hasn't he given up on us? Because his love endures forever. Behold, I have loved you. Put your name in there. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And with the bands of loving kindness have I drawn you. And David is saying, give thanks to the Lord, to the God of gods, to the Lord of lords, because his love endures forever. Remember what he's done in your life. Understand that he's going to continue to do these things in your life. It says in Psalm 98, uh, sorry, Psalm 94, verse 17. I think I got that right. The address may be wrong, but it says, Even when my feet did slip, your hand did lift me up. What a promise. Even when we slip, Psalm 12, 1 says that even faithful men and women fail. You can be faithful as all get out, and you still can fall. You can still fail. God lifts us up. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Verse 33, verse 27 says that his everlasting arms are underneath us to lift us up. He's lifting us up. First Thessalonians 5.24. These are some verses. If you can ever write these down on a post-it note, stick them on your car while you're driving, memorize, don't crash. Put them on your mirror, memorize while you're brushing your teeth. But brush your teeth, not your face, you know. Yeah. Memorize these because these are promises. First Thessalonians 5.24. Faithful, faithful is he who called you Put your name in there, and he will also do it. It's not you trying to fulfill a call before God. It's not tr you trying to be better. It's not you trying to be good. It's God in you through Jesus Christ, through his spirit, doing a work in you. Philippians 1.6 says, he is the one who called you, and he will also do it. Psalm 38, verse 8, fantastic promise says, he will perfect or complete that which concerns you. He's placed a calling on your life to know him and to make others get to know him. And he's the one who's going to do it. As you just keep opening up the book each morning, go into him in prayer, be humble, recognize that you do not have the answers in this life, but he does. And then walk with him. Because his love endures forever. <laughs>